Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, welcome to the Fireside Chat with Robert Luke. My name is Laurie Harrison, and I'm the Director of Online Learning Strategies at the University of Toronto. And it's my privilege to be the interviewer today as we all get a chance to learn a little bit more about Robert, what he's all about. Um, we've read his professional bio, and he's been introduced as the new CEO of eCampus Ontario. But I know that everyone is very anxious to get to know him and uh, find out a little bit more. And so today we're going to have a bit of an up close and, and personal interview with him to find out more about his background and what his interests are and his experiences in the past that might inform where we're going from here, um, as well as you know, his personal philosophies and uh, some of the quirks about Robert. I have the good fortune of having been a friend and colleague of Robert's for many years, and so uh, I have a few questions up my sleeve, hoping to prompt him to share a little bit about himself. So uh, we're actually retitling this session, and it's billed as Fireside Chat, with Robert Luke, but in keeping with the theme of humanizing, humanizing learning in the test conference program, uh, we retitled this session and we're calling it Humanizing Robert Luke. Uh, so Robert, do you wanna just say hello and uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your setting there. You've got something special in the background. Thanks a lot, Lori. Uh, it's really great to be connecting with you again, uh, how, however virtually, um, uh, in this forum. Uh, yes, I've got a, a fireside uh, chat, an actual fire going right back here. Um, you can't see this, but behind the camera is one of my cats who is sleeping. Just full disclosure, she might wake up and, you know, want some kibble or something. So she may come and enter the uh, the picture uh, with us. So I know it's humanizing Robert Luke, but um, well, this cat thinks she's a human, actually. So it's, it's all part of the theme, I guess. So I'm really pleased to be here, Laurie. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, setting this up. Okay, so let's get started and go a little bit into the past. We're going to go way back time machine and tell us a little bit about where's your hometown and uh, perhaps you can expand on that a little bit and tell us about your early years and, and some of your experiences there. Sure. Uh, so I grew up in Saskatchewan. I was born in a very, very small town in southwest Saskatchewan uh, named Herbert, actually. Uh, and the only reason I was born in Herbert is because the town where my parents lived was too small to have a a hospital so they had to go to the buzzing metropolis of Herbert uh, which was you know a little ways down the highway um, so my formative years obviously are very much defined by what it's like to live in a pretty vast and open environment and I think if I you know if I think back about what I learned from my time as a child growing up uh, on the prairie it's really about the value being open certainly and uh, being aware and listening but also the value of community one thing that, that I would say, though, about, you know, something that has had a direct impact on, on how I think back on learning is that, like, I can't think back without using a current lens. And so the thing I recall most was what I was not taught. For example, I was not taught about colonization, except that this is a thing that happened as a part of progress and that it was good. I was not taught about residential schools, and in fact, the last one closed in Saskatchewan in 1996, which is probably, when I learned that was very surprising to me. And I do know, when I think back on this, that my Indigenous friends and community members had a very different experience at school than I did. And this was apparent at the time, but it's really only in hindsight that I can fully understand why. So I think if I look back on my formative experiences learning in Saskatchewan, obviously for the most part, it was positive, um, but I do use that current lens of equity and decolonization and diversity and inclusion uh, to think that there was a lot we weren't taught that back then. And there was a lot of people who had uh, a, you know, a suboptimal experience in the educational system. And I think that's very important for us to acknowledge, particularly at this time when we all have a responsibility particularly for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action uh, and the, the, uh, the need to speak out against anti-Black and anti-BIPOC racism, that we are doing the most we can to, to create the most inclusive society that we can. And I think education is one of the most important things uh, that we can do in that, in that space. Great. Thanks for sharing and a bit of insight into your, your background and perhaps how your K-12 experiences influenced you. I know you have some thoughts you're going to share with us later. Um, I have a hunch about the importance of education in that sector and its relationship to higher education. Um, but moving on a bit past your early formative years, small town Saskatchewan, can you tell us a little bit about your university career 
um, what were you studying and uh, a little bit about uh, where things got started in terms of your higher education experiences. Yes, sure. And so I did my undergraduate degree in British Columbia for various reasons. Uh, I felt that it was an appropriate thing uh, to go west and, and go west, young man, <laughs> go west and learn. So I went to Vancouver and I applied to Simon Fraser University and they turned me down. I had been out turned of, you down. They turned me down. Me. No, I kid you not. <laughs> I, I had been out of high school for I think four years at that point in time because I was I had a you know I had a gap four years. I had a gap I had a gap degree I guess you could say. <laughs> um, uh, and so even though I had you know I had a A average in high school, um, they told me that the marks on my high school transcript. I remember this clearly from the rejection letter because it was wounding to me. Uh, the the uh, marks that I received in high school were no longer an adequate representation of the kind of student I might be today. And I thought, oh, okay, um, that's, that's, that's a thing. That happened. Um, and they said in the, um, in the letter, uh, we suggest that you go to a college and get, just get one credit. Show us that you can actually be a learner and then reapply and maybe we'll reconsider your application. Thanks very much. Uh, don't call us until you've got that credit. Um, so, you know, I was pretty disappointed um, because to be honest with you, it was the only application I did. Um, but uh, somebody I knew was going to a college at the time and uh, she said, oh, um, you know, you can apply to this college that I'm going to. And so I did, this was Douglas College in New Westminster. And uh, so I went there and uh, I entered what was called the University Transfer Arts Program. So I was taking a general arts degree uh, or like a general arts program and everything transferred um, yeah. to the, the baccalaureate uh, degree. Uh, and I ended up staying there for the entire two years because, well, very practical reasons. The, I mean, the level of instruction was fantastic. Uh, it was really close to my house. That's important. Um, the uh, classes were very small. I think they were capped at maybe 30 people, and it was about half the cost of going to university. Uh, oh, and all of those credits I took, uh, as I said, transferred to my degree. So like, right. it was kind of from an economic perspective, it made sense. Um, so I stayed there and um, did my first two years at Douglas College. And uh, when it came time to transfer, uh, I was trying to decide, should I go to SFU, even though they kind of turned me down and still want to go back? Should I go to UBC? Should I go to UVic? Uh, and I went to go talk to a professor, Howard Eaton, that's his name, actually. He taught English um, literature. And I said, uh, Mr. Eaton, you know, I'm trying to decide which university to go to to finish my, my undergraduate degree. Where should I go? And he said, you should go to none of those schools. You should go to UNBC. And I said, what's that? And I he said, it's the University of Northern BC. It's a brand new school. He said, you're from Saskatchewan. You're the pioneering type. You would do well there. So I did. I went to UNBC. I didn't even know, I didn't even know anything about Prince George. Uh, I had to look it up on the map. Uh, back in the day when we had a paper map, there was no Google Maps back in the 90s. Um, but it was really actually an important experience because, uh, so UNBC had been established, I think, several years earlier. Um, at, as a distance education um, institution to cover the, the northern part of BC, hence the name, University of Northern BC. Um, and this was the first campus that was built, and we were the first cohort of people in. So there were about 300 people in the entire university uh, that were studying. In fact, I like to joke, I think I was graduate 13 of that university. Uh, because <laughs> was that your student number? Number 13? Pretty much, yeah, because you know, there's, six, there's 12 people in front of me in line uh, from that first cohort out. And then, so I went in in third year. And by the time fourth year came around, like there suddenly were 700 people on campus. And we were all like, oh, my God, who's all these people? It's so busy here all of a sudden. But it was a very important experience because um, it was very much... Um, so they had a distance education mandate. And this was about, when did I go there? 94 to 96. And this thing called the Internet was just, you know, becoming a thing. And so uh, I got uh, a job doing uh, development of uh, e-learning resources for the English department. And in fact, I did two uh, independent studies to develop hypertext annotations of novels as study aids that were distributed over the internet. So we've got a picture of you. You're out west. You're having adventures. You're trying new things. You're making your way. Um, so then, what happened next? How did you? Uh, I think you might have had another stop along the way back in a uh, coming a little farther east. But 
where do we trace your path from there? Um, well, I went to grad school at Queens, so I moved to Ontario, and uh, that, so that's what brought me first to Ontario uh, to do a master's degree. Uh, but I stayed in Ontario because at Queens I met and married my spouse, who is from Toronto, and uh, that is really why I uh, why I'm here uh, today. We did, however, have a two year stint at the University of Lethbridge in southern Alberta. Uh, which was, you know, quite a lot of fun, really nice uh, natural environment, really, really interesting and uh, supportive academic community. Uh, but again, uh, you know, the focus there, I was running something called the Curriculum Redevelopment Center. Um, I think I was like the person who was staffing it, like it was kind of just me. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, the working hypothesis was that this thing called the internet might be useful for, in for education, so maybe we should figure out how to do it. And uh, so that's what uh, I did for a couple of years. And then I, I moved uh, back to Toronto and uh, you hired me, which was fantastic. Right. So now we're going to go down a, a different uh, different path here and get a little closer to home. So we're following your journey. You came back to Ontario. Um, and so why, what brought you back here again? Can you tell us about your early days and your experiences? I know you were at OISE. Uh, yeah. Tell us a bit about what was happening then. Well, I... Um, I came back to U of T to uh, do a PhD because I wanted to continue to, um, well, to, to study and to teach. Um, and uh, so that's obviously where we met as well. Um, yeah. You, as I just yeah. mentioned, hired me at the Adaptive yeah. Technology Resource Center. So for the bit more of the background for folks listening is that um, Robert and I shared a common experience. We both worked at what was then called the Adaptive Technology Resource Center under the leadership of Utah Trevoranis. Um, and, and in fact, it's, it's a true story. I, I hired um, Robert to work for us at the Adaptive Technology Resource Center. And I always say that was one of my most brilliant hires, if not my most brilliant. So he came and worked with us. Um, and I just want to follow that thread for a moment, Robert. Um, we know that technology has the potential to facilitate accessibility and inclusivity in education. Um, can you make some connections for us uh, between your work in this sphere, which, by the way, was carried on by you to sh she subsequently went to OCAD U, where Robert also was, um, mm -hmm. to uh, lead the um, uh, Inclusive Design Resource Center. Can you um, can you explore that a little bit and perhaps even connect it to the theme of the conference for us? It's a great question, Lori, and I would say from you, uh, I learned the value certainly of listening and inclusion. And uh, your leadership, I think, of that of that area was really instrumental in providing me with, uh, you know, a really uh, good and strong experience about what it's like to work within a large institutional context, uh, balancing multiple interests while uh, you know trying to follow through on the on the goals that were set for us. Uh, Utah, of course. Um, is very very well known in the uh, in the universal design space, and so working under her direction was really instrumental because I was studying uh, a mix between you know uh, education and information science. How do we design useful and usable information systems that will promote access and accessibility uh, for you know for people more generally uh, looking specifically at education, healthcare, and governance or government uh, engagement, this is in the early 2000s. Uh, but I think, you know, it does connect quite well with our conference theme of humanizing learning. Uh, Utah, for example, talks a lot uh, about designing from the margins so that we, we design for the complete span of human experience and capability such that when we design any system, any norm, any technologies, uh, they are inclusive. And so her point about designing from the margins is, you know, you, you figure out what the span of capabilities are and you make sure you cover all of those in any design rather than just saying, well, we're designing for this one user group over here or this one user group over here. Uh, and so for me, I think uh, that's very instructive to, to our conference theme because without humans, you know, we don't have technology. We have technology to mediate this in this uh, discussion, but it is the humans in the equation that are most important. And if those technologies are not sensitive, if they're not accessible, if they are not useful and usable, then this conversation can't happen, right? So that transmission layer is very important, but you and I are having a discussion that is more transformational. And that's a very important way to, I think, articulate Technology is really just a mechanism. It's the transmission layer that we have. But, you know, my goal always is to connect with other people. Right now, this is the best thing we've got. 
Very good. And it's pretty good right now. I'm enjoying chatting with you. So yeah. it's working for us. Um, so Robert, I want to move on to uh, another topic. Um, I'm going to go take a little bit of a different tangent here. So the the two of us, we we share the pride of both having received our PhDs from OISE, although I was 10 or 15 years behind you. Uh, but those of us who know you well really admire your sharp intellect. And I was wondering if you could share for us what's the most important academic work that you've read recently um, that has had an impact on your thinking? That's a great question. Uh, Pick one. Wow. Um, I think if I had to choose one, I would pick a book. Um, it's called Innovating, a Doer's Manifesto for Starting from a Hunch, prototyping, prototyping Problems, Scaling Up, and Learning to be Productively Wrong. I had to read that. Wow. Yeah, no, it's... We're going to have to send out the reference on that one unless everyone's quickly taking their notes. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a really good book, and one of the reasons why I like it. The author's name is Louis Perez Breva. Uh, it's from MIT Press. Uh, and the little you know the subtitle is "Innovating is for Doers." You don't need to wait for an earth-shattering idea, but can build one with a hunch and scale it to impact. And the reason why I like this is because I mean, just like the the you know the title says, like you 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 have a hunch when you want to try something new. Well, I think this might work. And rather than, you know, go down to your basement and build up, you know, like the final thing, the, most people wouldn't do that anyways. You want to take small, iterative, agile steps towards figuring out, okay, well, if this is going to be true, what do I need to be true in order to make that happen? And that's a, that gives you kind of like a stepwise approach to taking iterative steps towards figuring out, you know, is my hunch right or is it wrong? And can I go in different directions? And the part of that title that I really like is to be productively wrong. Right. We have uh, failing forward is another way of putting that right, where you learn. You yeah. learn. And we've certainly been doing that on a fast track in the last uh, few months, all of us having to iterate so quickly. Exactly. Well, fail fast, learn quickly. You know, you can never be a true success until you have succeeded at failure. I mean, there's there's a lot of these pressure makes diamonds. You know, like there's there's all kinds of ways that we can encapsulate this. Um, but I like this uh, this book. It, it was a you know, in some respects, you know, there's a certain amount of confirmation bias. Like it it was talking about something that that I would say, oh, for sure, I would use this when I'm teaching my class. Uh, Did because, everyone notice how Robert just threw confirmation bias into a casual, uh, you know, conversation here? So, if you're playing uh, conversation bingo, you can cross <laughs> that one. <off. laughs> um, but it, it's it's very helpful because it's you know it's in, it is an academic book, but we talk a lot about innovating, and I've done a lot of work on innovation policy. I've done a lot of work directly supporting people who are innovators, and for me, it's just a useful treatise, if you will that reminds us that we don't always know everything and that's okay, right? Done is better than perfect. We just got to figure out what's our next step and next step. And I, if I think about, you know, the situation that we're in right now, nobody really knows what's going to happen, you know, next week, next month, uh, next year. And it's really important for us to be, uh, you know, cognizant that we can still go forward um, knowing what we do know, but also being confident in what we don't know, and that the the value of the community in which we work is that there's somebody who's going to know something that I don't, and there's somebody else who's going to know something that we don't collectively know, and together we will figure out what we still need to know in order to help people advance. And that's everything from you know, greater inclusivity in our society, uh, how to keep storefronts open, how to reuse an N95 mask, like all of like, you know, from the from the quotidian yeah. to the to the, you know, the large strategic things, all of this benefits from taking that kind of, uh, you know, iterative and agile approach. Okay, thank you, Robert. That gives us a good insight into your academic interests at the moment. Now let's take a, a turn and perhaps you can share for us a little bit more on the personal side, uh, Netflix preferences. What have you been watching or binge watching lately on Netflix? Well, like most people, I'm sure my little internet spool is going very quickly at some uh, times of the day because you know we're all uh, watching a lot of uh, a lot of TV, and in many respects, it's good because there's a lot of good uh, a lot of good shows out there that are worthy of binge watching. I think one that I would say is a real standout, and to be honest with you, I can't remember if this is on Netflix or Crave, uh, but it's called "I May Destroy You," 
It's a British comedy drama series, and it was created and co-directed, written and produced by Michaela Coel. And it's actually a very powerful story. It tells the story of a young black woman who is coming to terms with the memory of a sexual assault. And it tells the story in a very unflinching way and raises themes of race, raises themes of gender, uh, generation, class, uh, technology, and, and the ways in which our world is increasingly mediated. I mean, it's very compelling, and it reminds us all of the emotional work that we all have to do at a time when we are addressing systematic anti-Black racism in our society. And I would highly recommend this because it was, uh, I would say, you know, a real game-changing kind of an approach to narrative for its unflinching approach and addressing those themes that are really, really important for us as a society to really come to terms with. Because, you know, as our, our goal here is about, in, in, is about inclusivity. And if I think back to the, the academic work I was just referring to, I mean, innovation is great, but without inclusive innovation, we don't have everybody uh, participating. Uh, in, in fully in, in our society. And we know, for instance, that the pandemic has exacerbated those, the experience of those ex already experiencing marginalization. And so I think, you know, from a, from a popular media perspective, I May Destroy You is a really good representation of, you know, the, the kinds of things that people grapple with, um, you know, with all of the themes that I mentioned. And, and I think importantly, as a viewer, what is our responsibility towards affecting the kind of change that we want in our society? Great. Thank you for sharing that. That's um, food for thought. I hadn't seen that, but I'm going to put it on my, my watch list and keep that in mind for uh, future watching to have a look at that. Thanks for sharing that. A very thoughtful response to what could have been a, a lighter question. Um, now, I know in the transition from your previous role at OCAD U, you had a, a little bit of a gap and you were getting ready. Everyone was excited you were coming to eCanvas Ontario, uh, but you, you know, you knew quite a bit uh, about, you know, what you were getting into, I expect. So tell us some, some uh, I guess, tell us a bit about what you learned about eCanvas Ontario uh, before you arrived, and then maybe you can uh, expand on that and tell us what you've learned since you've been in your new role for a few weeks. Sure. Uh, so I knew you know, a fair bit about eCampus Ontario, obviously, because it's an important organization in the post-secondary environment. I might argue it is the single most important organization in the post-secondary environment. Um, I had also received funding uh, for one of the pilots from eCampus Ontario for micro-credentials. So I've done a lot of work in micro credentials. In fact, back in the day when we were when I was working for you uh, at the ATRC, we were working on micro credentials, but we didn't actually. We call didn't know it. it. We didn't know that. Yeah, the uh, Snow Project, Special Needs Opportunity, opportunity Windows. Windows. Yes, that's right. We were doing short courses for teachers of students with special needs who had been integrated in their classrooms, yeah. early online learning, just in time. Yeah, it was. It was. I mean, I think pretty game changing for the time. Actually, if you think about it, I guess I knew. A, fair bit about eCampus Ontario and obviously on the way in I, I started you know did a deep dive uh, speaking of micro credentials went to school and uh, tried to learn and read as much as I could uh, since I've arrived I think you know it's been it's like starting a new job uh, in particular starting a job as CEO of an organization is going to be busy at the best of times I would say that you know particularly at a time like this when online learning or digital learning or virtual learning is, uh, you know, really at the fore. Uh, the job has been perhaps busier than more than than it might have been otherwise. I, I think it is rather like drinking from the fire hose while managing a denial of service attack. Yes, I think that uh, a lot of us are having those experiences of everything's on a faster timeline. So where you might have been given six months grace period to learn a new job and get acclimatized. You probably had six weeks or maybe six days. I'm not sure how fast that came at you. About six minutes, maybe. In my first week, I had a board meeting and an AGM, but it was really good because it was a good opportunity to listen first and foremost to, you know, what does the, my board want to have? What do our members want to have in the environment? Certainly uh, meeting with uh, uh, the uh, Ministry of Colleges and Universities and the Minister of Colleges and Universities and finding out, well, what is it that, that they are thinking about that is needed? And so really, I mean, I'm, I'm in listening mode trying to really figure out what, what I can do to support the community. And I would say the one thing I have really learned about the eCampus Ontario team is that they are 
a dedicated and committed group of professionals who are doing just an amazing piece of work, a, a bunch of pieces of work really to support the sector at, a, at an extremely busy and fraught time. They successfully managed that pandemic pivot to help support in ways that we could uh, all of our members across the province. And now our goal is to say, okay, what's the future of virtual learning look like? And how can we really provide the kind of uh, structures, supports uh, across the, you know, the, the various domains that we, uh, that we operate in? So I, the biggest thing I've learned about eCampus Ontario is how good the team is. Uh, they've been really wonderful to get to know. Uh, and they certainly have been very welcoming and patient with me as I ask an awful lot of questions about things that may be painfully obvious to them, but not to me. And I'm reminded of something Marshall McLuhan has said, which is, I don't know who discovered water, but it wasn't a fish. And this right. is an important moment when you're not fish coming into the fish bowl. Right, right. So you'll, you'll never not be a fish again. I'll never not be a fish again. Exactly. Now I'm a fish. I'm swimming. I'm just going to pull on another thread out of the conversation that we're having. You mentioned earlier that you thought that eCampus Ontario was the most important, perhaps, institution. I'm going to say, and I'm going to say in the province, maybe broader, but in the province. And I wondered if you could just expand on that. What do you see as being eCampus's unique role in the way it's situated in our, our current higher education ecosystem? I think our, our unique role, first of all, I would say, um, there are obviously there are many organizations that do uh, uh, similar kinds of things to us uh, that are as important to, as us. Contact North, OnCat, uh, for instance, to name two. Um, everybody is rowing in the same direction, and we are one part of that uh, rowing line. It's not my sport; I don't really know. Um, we're we're just one part of the team that is you know helping to to engage and be engaged and help move people forward. One of the reasons why I think we're we're particularly important is because in many respects, we're like the Switzerland of the post-secondary environment in this province. Like we're, we don't have the money. We don't, it's not like we're wealthy like Switzerland, but we, we're that neutral, honest broker that is sitting at the center of a bunch of wheels, much like a clutch that is helping to engage these. And I, if right. we think about what kind of future of education we want, which to my mind is one that is you know, certainly supporting uh, the development of skills and competencies uh, across the life cycle of everybody's lifetime, uh, certainly doing that in ways that is promoting engaged and thoughtful uh, citizenship and inclusion, uh, and doing that in ways that lets people seamlessly transfer from, say, high school to college to university to work back to university, back to work, back to college, or all of those at the same time. Uh, the world that we live in now is super complex, obviously, and uh, finding ways to navigate that is you know, going to be a challenge for us. One of the reasons why we, I think, are important there is because we play that honest broker role, kind of not in, necessarily in the center, but uh, functioning in a way to incentivize the kind of innovation that needs to happen in the, uh, in the sector, uh, to support these kind of pilots. Micro-credentials is a good example. We provide a, a framework for how they can be operationalized. We provide funding to sort out little um, you know, pilots here there while we help you know, the, the sector and the province figure out what's the policy apparatus that is going right. to make this happen. Yes, I think of eCampus Ontario as, as a big set of ears listening to the community and also channeling that and, and acting uh, on our behalf in, in terms of feeding it up to the ministry and so on. Absolutely. Great. Yeah, I know. I think that's really important. And I mean, certainly, as I said, I'm in listening mode and I'm trying to, it's ironic because I'm doing most of the talking here, but I, I am in listening mode um, and trying to, you know, really get a handle on what it is that, that our constituents need. And really important here, I think, is, is looking at this from an interest perspective rather than positional perspective. Right. You could take the position of the government, you could take the position of the public, you could take the position of the colleges, the position of the universities, and then you could even articulate positions within each of those constituents. But when we start to think about what people's interests are, then we can transcend the positions and get to more of a shared understanding. And, and I think in that way, and that requires us to listen. It requires us to say, okay, well, you know, I know what you, th what you want to have happen, but why don't you tell me why you want that to happen? Because maybe the way we think that that can happen is the same as how this other constituent over here would like 
to have that happen. Or maybe it's not the same way, but the outcome is the same. And listening is the best way to get there. So Robert, as you look into the future, Ontario is a very big ship and we're all curious about where we're all headed, but um, what's your forecast? If you had to highlight a few things that you're seeing on the horizon, what would they be? Uh, well, we've already talked about micro-credentials and I think that those will really come to the fore. I think that uh, micro-credentials are important ways that we can help to, you know, in the rebuild and recovery effort and to, uh, um, well, rebuild and, and work towards resilience. Uh, certainly, I think that there are a lot of things that we can do in the sector to incentivize things like credit transfer, uh, greater cooperation on shared services, um, and that kind of thing that are looking more of the, of the sector as a sector. Uh, that may take us a while to get to, um, but I think that, that it's an important goal to articulate because we're all trying to do the same thing, which is to educate our citizens and uh, finding ways to do that that... Um, is more outside in versus inside out, like looks at the learner and how they want to engage in the system versus how we have always existed and how we think the learner should engage. I think we have an important moment to try and, and uh, really think through what that might mean. Right, it's time for a shift in our thinking, that's for sure. So on that line, um, any further thoughts with the recent pivot is the, the word of the day these, these days. We've all had a big pivot, a um, lot of challenges, but uh, thoughts on how we can take what's been very challenging and perhaps draw some, some opportunities out of that. It's a good question, Lori. I think you know, we've all heard that every challenge is a good opportunity and it's really incumbent upon us to pull together and figure out what are the opportunities that we can we can use in this situation to reimagine the kind of systems that we have and uh, the kind of systems that we want to build education doesn't necessarily innovate its business models frequently um, or with alacrity uh, the fact that we have all been put in this same situation at the same time gives us an unprecedented opportunity to really examine what that means. And I'll go back to something that I uh, talked about at the, at the start, and that's about inclusion and how we help support those experiencing marginalization. That we have more awareness now of systemic biases and racism, uh, the exacerbation of those experiencing marginalization due to COVID-19, um, the disparate, uh, disparate uh, levels of participation, um, pay the gig economy. There's so many things that are, that are disrupting our immediate environments that we can't be immune from that. And so I think if we were to think through this as a, as a lesson and say, okay, we, you know, and there's many good or there are many good examples of this. Uh, certainly I've done a lot of work with the city of Toronto, uh, for example, on supporting kind of an all of community approach to the uh, rebuild and recovery efforts. And, and that I think is very heartening because we're having hard conversations for sure. We're all doing you know, a lot of hard work and there's a lot of emotional labor involved in this when we think about the inclusion aspects. Um, but I think it's an important time for us to acknowledge some of the disparities that we do have and to leverage this moment to build a, a better society that is more inclusive. Thanks for sharing that. I've also heard you talk sometimes about uh, digital first, digital by design. I wondered if you had any any comments uh, in terms of this transformation that's required and in, in, you know, in addition to rethink our, our thinking, then the outputs that we have uh, downstream are also obviously gonna be impacted. Any comments on that? Absolutely. I mean, e-learning or digital learning or virtual learning, call it what you will, has been with us for quite some time. Right. You and I have worked in this space for you know, over two decades since we were 10 or so. <laughs> the, the, um, <laughs> it has always kind of been this thing at the fringe. This is why I like that book about innovating, by the way, because it's about progressively thinking through ways that we can prove out hunches such that when we want to do something at scale, we can do that well. And I think um, you know, a lot of the education system was surprised that, oh my goodness, we have to go all online and we're not prepared to do that because it was new to us. And so digital learning or virtual learning has gone from this nice thing over here to being the thing that we need to do for the next year, possibly longer. Uh, this whole conference is online. Our whole discussion is online. It's not just learning, it's learning how to work. 
and also working to learn in that regard. And so I think, you know, the, the principle behind digital first is that while we want to always in, encourage face-to-face uh, -face learning, and we can stage some of that back, particularly in those professions uh, that really require it, um, and there are many. In fact, you know, learning by doing is, is, the, is the best way to learn anything. You know, we want to marry the cognitive with the effective, with the psychomotor, to go from head to heart to hand in our pedagogical approach, such that we can, we can generate that kind of sticky knowledge that is going to help us you know, be good people and be able to do good jobs at whatever work we happen to be doing. I think it's interesting what you're saying about learning by experience. Um, one group we haven't talked about too much in our conversation today is our faculty, and we will have a lot of instructors and faculty members who are joining in uh, to this interview. And uh, I was reflecting recently that our, our instructors have had a grand experience and ex experiential learning of their own. Yeah. Um, and, and they've been learning so much more in the last few months about teaching online than we could have ever imagined through our programs and so on over the last years. And then um, likewise for our students, they're learning how to learn online. So mm -hmm. um, we are really um, having to, to live that ourselves daily. Um, and I think there's lessons we can learn from our own experiences if we're reflective about it. What you just said actually is really, really important because our faculty have navigated this. They've been at the forefront of this. Our learners have as well, of course. Uh, but our faculty who are used to being the person who knows something and is confident in, in their approach to teaching has suddenly, for the most part, been thrown into a situation where they don't know. And this is, so I go back to that idea of, a, of a being productively wrong on a hunch. It's very, very hard to say to a faculty member, it's okay if something goes down. Right? Because they don't want that to go down. I don't want this system to go down while we're having this conference. That's a problem. But you know, we know that systems fail. The internet goes out. Somebody starts you know, downloading a movie in my, another part of my house and my internet connection starts going closer. <laughs> right? like this can happen and we need to learn how to roll with it. And when we learn how to roll with it, we get better at being resilient. So I'm glad you brought up the faculty because they're, they're one of the most important constituents that we have and learning about their experience. Anne Rivon, who's the president of Loyalist College and one of my co-chairs of, of my board, um, had said that it's not just that we need to ask people where we're going. We need to ask them what went well in the last six months. What didn't work for sure. We will have a big list of what didn't work, but what actually worked because that's how we can be productive, productively wrong, but also productive in our iterative and agile approach together to figure out how do we go from digital first to digital by design. Right. Designing artfully and meaningfully uh, constructive, useful and usable ways that we can encourage people to generate knowledge. Great, thanks for that, uh, that thought. And um, not quite our closing thought, I have one more question for you, so I'm gonna ask that now. Um, you mentioned resilience and um, it's, it's certainly one of the most important things for all of us to remember at this time with our theme of humanizing uh, learning. Can you share with us a little bit at this, uh, this time um, what it is that you do that, um, leading by example, what do you do to fill your bucket? What is it that uh, helps you to stay human in these, these challenging times? That is a, a really, really important question. Um, we all have suffered from Zoom fatigue, team fatigue, whatever fatigue. Right? There's a lot of screen time. And um, it's important to take that time away. Uh, I, uh, my spouse and I actually early on in the pandemic uh, found this forest just east of the city, north of Ajax, uh, that has a wonderful array of... Um, uh, marked trails in it. And so once a week, we would go uh, for a walk in this forest in different parts of it. And there's four or five different blocks. You could go in different areas. And in essence, it's like a choose your own adventure. You could go in this forest, you know, and have a different walk, you know, every day. You might see, like, read a few pages that you've seen before, but um, it's going to end up in a different way. And it's been really nice to, uh, first of all, have that time for, for us to have that time together together. Um, which is good and to have that time outside uh, which is better because it's you're outside you're you know, you're walking around getting exercise uh, and we were able to look around and you know watch the trilliums come into bloom and then go into the the next flower cycle and 
Uh, and then, of course, in July, the mosquitoes came. That was kind of sub Mosquito cycle. <laughs> Mosquito cycle. Uh, right. But we walked by a pond once, and there were bullfrogs calling out. Um, you know, there we saw pileated woodpecker, blue jays, cardinals, yellowbirds, downy woodpeckers. Right. Um, we even saw a red-spotted newt in its eft stage, which I didn't know what it was. I had to Google it. I had to Google orange lizard in Ontario. <laughs> I like, kid you not, this lizard was orange. I thought I was walking down the trail and I thought, oh, some child has lost their toy. That's unfortunate. <laughs> and then it moved. So well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that that story. Um, some of you, you might be able to just make out in the background, the back wheel of my bicycle is poking out there. So my, uh, the way I fill my bucket is I get out on the bike and same sort of thing uh, through the seasons. And now we've got leaves on the trails. So I may be biking all winter. I'm not sure. I think I'm going to have to keep it up in order to stay sane. Uh, so uh, that's our, our closing question. And I just want to thank Robert so much for his sharing of his insights, personal insights, professional insights, experiences, uh, his crystal ball looking at the future. Uh, he seems to have some good ideas about where we can all head together. So thanks once again. Thank you very much, Lori. And uh, the thing I would say in closing, it's, it's not so much that, that I have any good ideas, if I have any ideas at all. It's that I am here to listen and to support the ideas that emerge from our community. And it's my job to help us all realize that shared co-created future.